So how is everybody? Let me just get organized here. Somebody brought me a gift of a doll and our knickers are falling off. I was wondering if there's some, is there some hidden meaning here, Kathleen? My knickers never fell off. <laughs> so, um, I'm wondering if, um, if many of you have looked at the paintings already, because it's a really powerful um, painting exhibit. And I was kind of going to be a little spontaneous and see what came out when I looked at the paintings and what they represented to me. I can't get inside Patrick Graham's head. But uh, how many of you have, have looked at the paintings already? Oh, okay. So they're melancholy, right? They're sad. They're Irish, they're Irish somebody said. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to um, just really off the, off the top of my head um, give you songs, a couple of poems, a reading from my book. Um, this painting here the dead swan reminds me of two things, a song and a, a passage from James Joyce's The Dead. My young love said to me, my mother won't mind, and my father won't slight you. For your lack of kind, he stepped away from me, and this he did say. It will not be long, love, till our wedding day. He stepped away from me. And he moved through the fair. And fondly I watched him move here and move there. He made his way homeward with one star awake. As the swan in the evening moves over the lake and the people were saying that no two air were wed but that one had a sorrow that never was said he smiled as he passed with his goods and his gear. And that was the last that I saw of my dear. Last night as I lay sleeping, my dead love came in. So softly he came that his feet made no din. He placed his hand on me, and this he did say. It will not be long, love, till our wedding day. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain and the hillsides, falling too on the Bog of Allen, and further westward softly falling into the mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling too on every part of the lonely churchyard where Michael Fury lay buried. It was softly drifted on the crooked crosses and the headstones, 
on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned as he heard the snow faintly falling through the universe and falling faintly upon all the descent of their last days on all the living and the dead. So he has, a paint, he has a painting upstairs called His Father's Garden. Now I don't know if he means, you know, Jesus or God or if he means his own real Father's Garden. There's no flowers or anything in it. But it made me think of uh, Seamus Heaney's poem about his father, which is a wonderful poem. Hold on, she said, I'll run out and get him. The weather here is so good, he took the chance to do a bit of weeding. So I saw him down on his hands and knees beside the leak rig, touching, inspecting, separating one stalk from the other, gently pulling up everything not tapered, frail and leafless, pleased to feel each little weed root break, but rueful also. Then found myself listening to the amplified grave ticking of hall clocks where the phone lay unattended in a calm of mirror glass and sunstruck pendulums and found myself then thinking, if it were nowadays, this is how death would summon every man. Next thing he spoke and I nearly said I loved him. Um, so, these paintings are dark, but there's a little bit of hope in them. He's got birds in his paintings, and to me, birds represent some kind of hope, and his son is named Robin, um, so I'm going to sing you. Oh, and he has a painting called The Lark in the Morning, and this song is actually called, it's, it's talking about the lark in the morning. Any Gaelic speakers here? Because I translated this myself, so... Don't hold me to perfection, okay? <laughs> the cool May. I'll sing it in English first. I, <clears throat> I have seen the lark soar high at morn, heard his song up in the blue. I have heard the blackbird pipe his note, the lark and the linnet too. But there's none of them can sing so sweet, my singing bird, as you. Ah, 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 my singing bird as you the whole on
Now, I don't want to drive you to distraction by reading for hours and hours from my book, so I'll read you, um, since fathers seem to be uh, on the agenda tonight, I'll read about my father. I was going to read for Margaret, Mar it's Margaret's birthday, happy birthday, Margaret, and I was going to read for her dad, but her dad didn't come. But I'm but he mightn't have liked it anyway because it's not a great picture of a dad, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's why I left him at home. <laughs> anyway, let me, let me find my stories about my dad. There's not a lot of light up here. Um, children begin by loving their parents. After a time, they judge them. Rarely, if ever, do they forgive them. Well, I didn't, I didn't make that up. That's from Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Loving my father was easy when I was little. I have a photograph of the two of us when I was about two and he was about 27 or eight. We look like we are completely in love with one another. The picture was taken in front of a little huckster shop in the lane where we lived. My hair is snow white. Oh. Plus ça change, as they say, in France. <laughs> my hair is snow white. Snowball was my nickname. And I'm wearing some homemade clothes, lacy socks and shoes with ankle straps. My father's hair, in contrast, is jet black and very wavy. He is sharply dressed in slacks, sports jacket, shirt and tie. I can't see his shoes, but I know they are the shiniest ones on earth, for he polished them compulsively. We both have large eyes, and his hand is on my hand. Our hands are identical, except for the difference in size. My father could never disclaim me. I was his first child. Mammy told me the story of the day I was born. She was in Hollis Street Maternity Hospital, and she asked Daddy to go and buy her the lemon drops that she was craving. Somewhere along the way, he ran into his mate, Jack Nail, who had just gotten a tip on a horse running in the 3.30 at Leopardstown. They didn't have a penny between the two of them to back the horse, but my father noticed that Jack Nail was wearing a brand new pair of shoes. Next thing you know, they were in Brereton's pawn shop pawning the new shoes. Jack Nail came out in his bare feet and the two of them went to the bookie to back the horse. It came in at 10 to 1. And needless to say, my mother and the lemon drops were forgotten as the two of them got ossified spending their winnings in the local pub, The Hive. Jack Nail's wife shouted at him about that for the next year and Mammy never let my father forget that he was AWOL the day of my birth. Still, I was the apple of his eye and he used to take me out to show me off. We'd go to the Drunkard's Mass at Mespel Road Church in Dublin so called because it was the latest mass on a Sunday morning and the, and the crowd usually overflowed out onto the sidewalk. There my father would meet up with his drinking buddies from the night before and make sure everyone had a chance to see his beautiful girl. He was the center of my universe and I felt completely secure in his love. But it didn't last long because before long he took off for England. Judging my father became easy as I moved out of childhood innocence into adolescence. He failed to provide for his family and on top of that a new baby arrived every year or two and he spent more and more time in the pubs and left my mother to manage as best she could. Some of my earliest memories are of running alongside Mammy as she pushed the pram with two or three kids in it from pub to pub trying to find Daddy in the hopes of catching him while he still had a few shillings left. I can still hear the wheels of the pram on the cobblestones, feel the rain on my head, and the smell of piss in the alleyways. Often daddy's mates would lie and say they had not seen him and he would go home empty handed with mammy in tears. He had a habit of coming home drunk on a Friday night with the evening herald tucked under his arm. He would unfold it, put his razor, shaving brush, toothbrush and toothpaste inside the newspaper and announce I'm taking the mail boat to England to look for work. I would cry and grab his legs and beg him, Daddy, Daddy, don't go. He would disappear for months or years. I couldn't tell how long. And I began to shut him out of my affections. I just couldn't stand the pain of losing him over and over again. 
Life with my father got worse as I got older. By the time I left home at 17, it had become a nightmare. He spiraled downward into alcoholism and violence and became a punitive, nasty husband and father. Every night we waited in fear of another drunken drama when he arrived home after the pubs closed. I sometimes dreamed of ways to kill him. One night he threw a coat that I was knitting onto the burning fireplace and I gave him some lip, as he called it. And we had by the fireplace one of those really heavy irons that you heat on the fire for ironing your clothes. He picked it up and flung it across the room at me and my mother jumped in front of me to save me from the blow and it knocked her unconscious. And I thought she was dead. I was down on my hands and knees begging her not to die. An ambulance was called and she was taken to hospital where she stayed for 10 days. Later that week while Mammy was in the hospital I tried to kill my father. I knew a policeman who had a girlfriend. It seems funny now. Yeah. I didn't kill him, obviously. I wouldn't be standing here, right? <laughs> I knew a policeman who had a girlfriend who worked at a hospital, and I knew he fancied me. So I flirted with him so I could get him to ask his girlfriend to get a bottle of barbiturates for me. One night when my father came home filthy drunk, my sister Gemma was fixing him some chicken noodle soup, and I dumped the bottle of barbiturates into the soup. I didn't wait for him to die, I just hightailed it out of there and caught the next boat and train to England. Well, my dad didn't die, he just slept for 72 hours apparently. I didn't know that. But in any case, I was confident that had I killed him I'd get away with it. Hadn't he tried to kill me and almost killed my mother? <laughs>